Uh, today's experts uh, probably need no introduction, but uh, so I'll give them a quick one. Uh, they've both spent most of their career, or much of their career, thinking about firm specificity and really have pushed it to new heights, pushed us to think about it differently uh, and probably better. Uh, so uh, our first speaker is Heli Wang from Singapore Management University. She's the Janice Velas Professor of Strategic Management there in Singapore. And our second speaker is DK Krasinski. He's an Associate Professor at Brigham Young University. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Heli. All right. Thank you, Rhett and, and uh, Samasa for uh, organizing this. I'm really happy to be here. And good morning, everyone. Um, let me let me first share my screen. Okay. All right. So uh, um, I have to admit before I start that um, uh, in the past few years, my uh, attention has been diverted to some other research areas, um, mainly in the CSR area and sustainability area, and. Uh, so, so I, when I, you know, first, uh, you know, get the invitation on this, I thought, oh, well, I'm going to talk about it. Not, you know, I haven't worked so much on this recently. So, uh, but I decided to, yeah, to come, come here to basically to learn, also share and learn at the same time. And hopefully, this session will also help bring back my passion in this area, which is uh, has always been there. And uh, I like to also hear feedback and then other ideas and also learn more from from the rest of the group. From, from David and the rest of the group. So um, some of the, okay. Uh, this is what I, uh, I'm aware of what's, you know, what by looking at him, I might meet some kind of, uh, the, some of the, the developments uh, in the area, but some of the things that I have noticed is uh, the recent literature um, and more and more seem to suggest that the difference or the distinction between firm specific human capital and the general human capital uh, may not be as clear cut as what traditional literature suggests. So traditional literature generally really distinguishes these two types of human capital and uh, their distinct differences determines that uh, you know, the firm specific human capital is uh, uh, non-transferable and source of competitive advantage and but at the same time also give rise to the opportunity for uh, uh, hold up and uh, then uh, firms obtain quasi rents from it. And employees on the other hand will have the incentive concerns. So this is the general argument of traditional literature. But as the recent studies suggest a lot of you know, different uh, scholars have worked on the area suggest that first of all, transferability of firm specific human capital and non-transferability and general human capital may not be as, the, as you know, it may not be true, basically. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it can be kind of reversed uh, in certain conditions. And then the, uh, David and his colleagues has, uh, has recent work on, I, I'm very interested to, to learn and to, to know what they're doing. I think he's going to talk more on it, about the firm's incentives, which is alternative kind of, a, a not necessarily alternative, but definitely is, uh, can be, uh, uh, in a way, can uh, have become a potential to create human capital-based advantage even in the absence of firm subsidy human capital. And there's other uh, studies uh, uh, talk about a cognitive biases in employee perceptions of firms and human capital, which suggests that uh, employees may not care as much about human capital as the literature suggests. And there's also other evidence, it's interviews, if you ask people, and uh, see MBA students or even uh, executives and what they think about firms of human capital. Sometimes they, they don't really uh, acknowledge that there's a clear difference between the two. So, so given this um, uh, literature as well as the, the, some of the evidence interviews, then uh, the conclusion here seems to suggest that managers and employees are not as much concerned about firm subsidy or firm subsidy human capital as the traditional literature suggests. And uh, the importance of firm subsidy in human capital and its implications for firm performance might be exaggerated. Um, and on the other hand, um, there are other evidences and uh, the, the, uh, including some of them, my own work actually suggests the opposite might be, not necessarily the opposite is true, which is basically also there provide additional support to the traditional view of uh, 
the difference between the two type of human capital. So, uh, for example, and just very quickly, we won't go through details, of course. So, uh, some of my uh, research on, um, for example, there's an earlier study I had on employees in terms of uh, um, the firm's specific knowledge, which entails the potential investment from employees for human capital, for specific human capital investments, uh, will only generate competitive advantage or will more likely to generate generate competitive advantage if the company uh, created the employee governance, which, for example, share ownership, employee share ownership, or better firm employee relationships, which suggests that you do need to address employees' potential concerns for investments in firms of human capital in order for um, firms of knowledge to generate rents for the firm. And similarly, another study has also suggested that CEO combination also matters for, for for firms with more firm specific knowledge. Um, and also anti-takeover protections uh, also kind of help uh, managers and employees reduce their concerns for investments. So we find that for them, when for companies that erect anti-takeover protections, this the uh, the, 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 I'm trying to think about it, the, the specific argument. So the, the basically these companies will have an increase, have an increase in their firm specific knowledge stock compared to some other uh, companies without this any takeover protection. So, so all of this um, seem to still suggest that there's a difference uh, between firms of human capital and general human capital in a way that at least the firms care enough to using all kinds of uh, either compensation mechanism or governance mechanism uh, to uh, address potential concerns associated with such investments. So the, there seems to be a puzzle here. Uh, if, I, if you take both literature as a kind of uh, valid in different ways, uh, employees or managers do not seem to be very much concerned about the, the risks associated with their firms of human capital investments, uh, or at least not as much concerned as the literature suggests. And uh, then uh, why do companies still erect governance mechanisms that address such concerns, which may not even exist if as you know, described in some of the studies. So uh, I provide in the next couple of slides, provide some explanations that are what I, I can think of and then potential research opportunities, uh, which can help address this, uh, the issues raised. Uh, so first of all, there could be a difference in perceptions um, to the extent that a firm specific human capital is difficult to observe and, uh, and measure, that's what we, we all know, it might be more likely to lead to differences in perceptions. Uh, differences between uh, the firm, maybe uh, the board and decision makers uh, and the employees or managers. So they may per per perceive concerns associated with this such investment differently. Um, th but, but then of course, that you need the future research may, may kind of examine for you. First of all, is there a discrepancy in their perceptions? Are they board members or uh, when you talk about employee investment, are firm or uh, board members or top managers have different perceptions compared to employees? So if you talk about the manager perceptions and you also wanted to see whether board members um, perceptions different from managers. Um, and also, if there's a difference, then what are the possible reasons for the difference? Um, once, one, one possible reason may be psychological bias related. I can think of, uh, actually, this is not invoking any literature, just based on some observations. For example, some cities are consider, considered very dangerous, maybe high crime rate. But it's more likely the case that outsiders who are not living in the city perceive the city more dangerous or more risky than those really live in the city. They don't feel as much uh, as, so you may talk local people, they don't feel as dangerous as, as you know, outsiders would think. So in that sense, the, as given employees making investment, maybe they're the ones that uh, they don't feel that, you know, so much risk, I had to think about the hold up risk, they had to, you know, uh, alternate my, uh, uh, my, my incentives accordingly, you know, all those issues, but it's, it's not, that, not necessarily there. But outsiders then uh, who are not making the investment may perceive this is some, you know, serious issue that needs to be addressed. I'm not sure that, you know, any series fit in this uh, kind of arguments, but uh, uh, might be something to think about. And or directly examine another 
possible research to examine the consequence or cost of using these government's mechanisms and compensation or um, different kind of controlling mechanisms to address firms of human capital. If this uh, the problem is not as serious as argued in the literature, and by erecting this kind of uh, different government mechanism, actually it's, it's impose extra cost to the firm. In that case, actually, if you compare the firm that you know, have done differently, then you should see some difference in their performance or long-term. Um, and then some other, another, I think the last slide, uh, is, is, is basically there's a, um, another possible explanation I, I can think of is uh, uh, something an analogous to um, the agency theory success. That's, uh, we all kind of aware that for you know, agency is very, very, very successful has been you know, in the both uh, finance and management and all other many other fields. Um, but uh, this popularity has caused actually um, some kind of institutionalized misunderstanding of top managers. Um, Consequently, maybe it's basically because really affect market behavior and firm behavior in a way that is not really conform to reality. So, um, so some studies have, have uh, observed that uh, markets just react based on agent theory prediction without really taking into consideration of the real um, behavior of the firm. Um, so similarly, uh, it could be the case that a traditional human capital series might have also caused such a misunderstanding because the, the firms of human capital, general human capital distinction and implications are so, could be uh, so well known and so much embedded in the um, managers, decision makers or board, I don't know, the, in their minds that um, they just take it for granted that this such behavior must exist or whatever issues, concerns associated with this kind of investments must exist. And then they should definitely should then erect whatever policies, governance mechanism to, to address that, uh, even though that may not exist. So this is quite a, yeah, there could be another reason to explain the causes of difference in perceptions. So future of research in theater might examine the, the roles of institutional forces or stereotype typical views on human capital. Um, particularly companies more influenced by human capital theories, uh, this is maybe difficult to identify, but conceptually, firms more influenced by human capital theories may be more likely to erect governance or reward mechanisms. Um, for example, uh, so how do you identify companies with such backgrounds? The, again, this is not a really well thought. You just throw in some kind of a, um, maybe not so realistic in terms of measurement or organization, but something to think about. Uh, manager board, maybe with certain backgrounds that uh, they graduated in certain universities, or maybe studied with professors or have schools, the university with professors that uh, specialize in human capital research. Um, or uh, another possibility, look at report announcements that often mention human capital associated with concerns. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I'm sure there's a lot of creativity can come up from from the related ideas. Uh, I think that's it. That's my uh, um, presentation. Um, thank you very much. I turn over to David. Uh, let me stop here. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Haley. It's uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Thanks, Rhett and Samantha and the organizers, and thanks uh, thanks Haley. I, I, um, uh, the the work and I know Hali, you several years ago presented uh, something something similar to this and I think it was in Copenhagen if I remember um, but uh, anyways you you but you were you were pushing back on you were pushing back on some of the pushback in in the human firm specific human capital conversation and raising some of the, these puzzles. And it's been a really influential conversation for me. So, um, so when I was uh, when I was an aspiring doctoral student and uh, and and trying to figure out you know how to make my way in the world, um, uh, Rob Kazanjian, who was on my dissertation committee, one day walked into my office with Hulee's 2009 SMJ paper and said, "Isn't this what you want to do? It looks like somebody else has already done it better. So, uh, good luck. Find something else to do." And and uh, so that I, that sp I spent the next month of my life wrestling with that 2009 paper, wondering if I had a way to be different from that, and uh, and how I could how I could do something for moving forward. But what's been really interesting is that um, when I look at, at in particular the 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 pattern of of Hulley's work, it's really compelling. It makes a very compelling case for the traditional story. 
Yet some of my own work and some of, and many of you on, on this call and, and others have, have offered very legitimate challenges to that traditional perspective. And so I find myself very much torn. And so I, I'm really compelled by this, uh, by this puzzle. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of power in thinking about uh, differences in perceptions and this possibility that maybe we have, uh, for the sake of theory, gotten so caught up in the theory that we've affected the way that managers and practitioners think about the world in a way that may or may not be fully helpful and that maybe that, that, that's part of the puzzle. So I think that's, these are very, very, very fruitful paths for us uh, to think about moving forward. So, uh, so really, really honored to be, uh, to be on the stage with you, uh, Lee, and, and to continue to learn from your, your great work. Um, so let me, um, let me transition here. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share my slides. I'm just gonna kind of hover over my slides. And so you can pin, pin me, uh, pin my view if you want a larger view of it or something like that. And that, this allows me to kind of, uh, you know, float over my slides and feel, feel really special while I present. So, um, <clears throat> so let me dive into a couple of things that I think builds off of, uh, very, very much off of the, the comments from Huli a few minutes ago. Um, so, so there's this question of, do we still need firm specificity? And I think this is the, the puzzle that Huli is, is raising for us. Do we still need firm specificity in our conversation? Um, there's all these, th these traditional comments, and then there's like a, a modern sort of challenge to that comment. Do, um, is, it, is it critical for competitive performance or not? Does firm specific human capital constrain mobility or not? And you have all these like uh, these kind of traditional stances plus a, a more modern stance that challenges that. And, um, and so we're left with this big question, you know, is firm specificity helping us to create parsimonious theory or is it just distracting us? Is it creating something that's just confusing or is it helping us actually move towards something that's, that's helping us explain what's really going on in the world? So there's a host of questions here that I think are really powerful. Um, and and it that should cause us to step back and ask really important questions about, uh, about our literature. So for me, when I think about firm specificity, for me, firm specificity is when something, like who knows what that something is, but something is specialized to the firm. And so it's not, not, not necessarily co-specialized, although such a thing could occur. It's that, that the firm kind of exists and some asset of some kind is being specialized to the firm. So we've got, you know, some fancy shaped asset that, that will slide over and fit in nicely with the firm. And we have this, oh, this, it looks like a complementarity. And that's really what firm specific human capital is capturing this complementarity where one plus one is greater than two. And to me in the world of strategy, this is central. Like this is a central concept to strategy because how can you have economic profits without complementarities? How can you have this, uh, the, these kind of, this kind of value creation unless you have two assets that are more valuable together than they could be apart? And so it's hard for me, you know, this is the core of, of, of firm specificity, the idea that something is co-specialized to the firm in a way that creates more value together than they could apart. How could we not have this as a central concept for strategy theories? It seems very, very important. So, um, but, but nevertheless, we still have all this confusion in the firm specific human capital conversation. So to me, it's, I'm stepping back and asking a question, maybe we need to be more careful about what kinds of things are specialized to the firm. Like, what are these things that we're looking at? Like, what are they really? And conceptually, what do they, what do they mean? And so one of the ways that, that Russ uh, and Ben and I have played with this idea is by looking at firm specific incentives. And what we know is that workers create and offer value to the firm through their human capital. This is the vehicle through which workers create value for their organizations. They bring their human capital, they apply their human capital, and positive outcomes occur at work. But they don't just do this for free. Firm employees and workers need to get something back from the firm, and that comes in the form of incentives. Incentives very broadly defined here. It's the utility, the positive utility that employees get by coming to work every day and contributing. And this is classic, right? There's no, nothing new or surprising here. This is just the classic two-way relationship between workers and firms. Both entities have to get value in the relationship for the entity, for the relationship to persist and survive. Now, what I find is fascinating is that our human capital conversation has spent a ton of time looking at one side of this relationship, which is the human capital side of the relationship. And we've talked a lot about generic human capital, although we don't necessarily call it generic human capital when we study it, but there's just tons and tons of literature looking at these generic skills that are highly transferable. 
And then in the strategy literature, we've spent a lot of time thinking about firm specific human capital, these times and places and ways in which knowledge, skills and abilities are highly customized to the particular firm in the particular context. But what's fascinating to me is that we've spent very little time in the strategy literature talking about the other side of the conversation, the other side of the coin. We've, uh, we have a lot of literature in OB and HR thinking about uh, incentives and benefits and all the ways that firms create value for workers, but it doesn't quite take go far enough to think about when those types of incentives might be highly firm specific or tied to the firm or where the value that workers derive from the firm is really unique to that organization. And, um, and it's not really surprising. I mean, most of us who have been around for a while, we recognize that lots of firms have like create and offer value to workers that other firms can't or don't. So it's not like, it's not like this is like an earth shattering idea, right? It's just, it's, it just happens. We know it happens. But what Russ and Ben and I have done is just try to put some theory to it to say, what does this actually look like in theory? But the reality is that we have done really nothing in this space other than to open the box and scratch the surface and say, we think we should look here. And so to me, I think understanding that incentives can vary in firm specificity and trying to unpack what that means. We look at all the richness that we have on the firm specific human capital conversation. It seems to me that there's a parallel opportunity with firm specific incentives to be just as rich and just as careful and just as detailed and understanding that firm specific incentives might create these economic profits in ways that are parallel to firm specific human capital or the theories we have for firm specific human capital. Now, another way that, <clears throat> that I've been thinking about what firm specificity of something different is looking at firm specific tasks. And this is with uh, Torsten Groshan and with Shad Morris. And we're really inspired by uh, this work uh, of, of, I see Greg on the call, Greg, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and Rob Ployhart and Anthony Nyberg that this, um, I love this human capital is dead paper, to me kind of a classic paper, uh, really helping us conceptualize what human capital is and what it isn't. And there's this piece in here that, that, that there's this comment that they make in their 2015 paper that has just caused me to ruminate for years. And it's that human capital is an individual's KSAOs, knowledge, skills, and abilities broadly defined, all these things that we carry around with us that can help us do stuff, right? And But they become human capital when they're applied to economically relevant outcomes. And so they're just KSAOs until they become economically relevant for a firm. And that's when we call them human capital. And what I think is fascinating about this is that what they're telling us is that what what the, the KSAOs don't really matter from an economic perspective until they're applied to, in my words, a firm task, a task within the firm that is essential for the firm's production function. So really what they're telling us is that what we've been calling human capital is actually kind of a complementarity between KSAOs that the individuals have and the tasks embedded within the firm that have to get done in order for the firm to create economic value. And so it's, it's sort of looking at this and saying, if we take their argument seriously, and Rob Ployhart, his forthcoming JOM commentary, if you haven't seen it yet, it's fascinating, um, looking at where he talks a little, he takes this a little bit further and talks about um, when KSAOs are relevant for performance behaviors and outcomes within the firm. There's something about KSAOs being tied to tasks that become really important. And if that's true, then to us, what that means is what the literature has thought of as one thing or human capital is actually at least two things firms tasks plus employee KSAOs and when those two things come together in some complementary kind of way. So if that's true, then we can think about this in terms of employees that have a whole portfolio of knowledge, skills, and abilities. Some of those, a small subset of those might be relevant for the firm and the firm's tasks. The firm has certain tasks embedded in the production function. When these things match, when employees bring their skills to those tasks, then we create value for the firm. And what it means here is that we have opportunities for KSAOs to be customized to tasks or specialized to tasks. And then we have opportunities for tasks to be specialized to the firm in which they're embedded. Now, uh, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I don't have time to go into this in tons of detail. I'm just trying to sort of raise what I think is an important issue. But the possibility here for us is that tasks themselves might vary in firm specificity. So a firm can have a task and that task could be very general, meaning that any firm could perform that task in the same way and create value from it. Or the task could be highly firm specific. And so Google has a proprietary search algorithm and it's embedded in a complex set of resources and capabilities. And so there might be many, many tasks within Google that are very tied to Google. 
And so they could be highly firm specific tasks, meaning that they uniquely create value within Google, but they probably don't create value in other places. And then at the same time, KSAOs might be specialized to individual tasks in important ways. And if so, that suggests this two by two where we have the task specificity of KSAOs compared to the firm specificity of tasks. And when we look at it like this, we sort of reorganize the literature and say down here in this corner, we have traditional general human capital where, um, where you have um, stuff like uh, uh, skills that are easily transferable across tasks and tasks that are performed in multiple firms. Up here, this is where we put industry specific human capital because you might be a brain surgeon, very, very, very occupation or profession specific human capital, knowing how to perform brain surgery. But you can do it at any hospital, any surgery center, you can go and perform those brain surgeries. So the, the KSAOs are highly specific, but the task is not firm specific, or the, the task is not firm specific at all. We have some, some things here that are high task specificity of KSAOs and high firm specificity. This seems, seems to match the logic of traditional firm specific human capital. But down here, this cell where the task is highly firm specific, but the KSAOs are quite general, this is the cell that we think might actually be creating a lot of confusion in the literature because we see human capital or KSAOs that are easily transferable to other firms and it doesn't look like there's mobility constraints, but the task itself is uniquely valuable in the firm. So we have individuals bringing general KSAOs to firm specific tasks. The outcome is highly firm specific, but it doesn't constrain mobility. And we don't have to see the labor market outcomes that we sometimes uh, sometimes observe. So the point here is that I think it's just really valuable to start separating out these things that maybe we need to think differently about tasks and KSAOs in our theory and be really precise about what we're talking about. I think this is partially important because one of the ways I might be reconciling the puzzle in my own head that Hali brought up is that maybe what we've got is we have um, maybe Hali has been studying in a really careful way firm specific tasks that are central for a firm's competitive advantage and competitive capabilities. And what we have is potentially some general KSAOs that are being applied to those highly firm specific tasks. And so maybe there's a way to understand that a little bit better. So to me, I think we have a lot of opportunities to look at firm specific incentives, tons of questions here. I think we just barely scratched the surface and didn't do really a fantastic job of, of fleshing out what's going on with firm specific incentives. And then I think lots of work is required here to really look at, at tasks and KSAOs separately, to be really thoughtful about these separate conceptual entities in our human capital conversation. And then that leads me to wonder what other conceptual things might vary in firm specificity. Like what other stuff out there in, in this conversation of human capital might vary in firm specificity that we haven't looked at really specifically and carefully yet. So uh, I think I went over time. Gosh, I did go over time. I'm sorry, Lee. I'm sorry for going over time, but now I'm done. Uh, I think I went over time also, so, so you're fine. <laughs> so uh, do I have a couple minutes maybe? Uh, just, just very quickly, I think we, we, are, we are running out of time. Um, so I, I really uh, like the, what you presented. There are so many things that uh, um, I think I really learned from that. And I enjoy and reading the, your, your work, new work on firms with incentives. I, I do think that it has a lot of value, which is parallel to firms with human capital. I also like the idea that it often, in order for it to create value, is tied to the unique firm resources or unique firm, uh, what do you call that? The, but, but, but then you, you talk about these tasks, uh, KOS uh, versus tasks. I have to admit, I didn't, wasn't able to read the, whatever the studies that particularly talk about this kind of uh, differentiation between the two. Uh, just based on what you presented your slides, uh, I was wondering uh, how much, so somehow the, the term of tasks, um, yeah, I wondered, you know, conceptually, uh, would it, you know, make more sense to still think about the, the using the, the concept, the strategy concept, core resources or core strategy, uh, something unique about firm or unique resource, unique strategy. Uh, and, and the firm's the employees, KAOS, is, uh, um, is, is specialized to these resources, but the resource itself can be broad or narrow. I, I don't know, I just think about how this, you know, can, can you know, conceptually different from the task idea you talked about. Maybe it is, but I didn't uh, appreciate as much yet. Um, 
So mm -hmm. the resource can be can be within the firm actually broad, applied in multiple projects or tasks, or whatever. Uh, and in that that can allow this firm to the KOS or whatever for specific for general human capital to apply in different um, in different whatever applications of the resource in the, within the firm, which is give them flexibility in terms of applying the resource. But on the other hand, if you have a core resource which is very narrowly applied, then in that case you will have firms in human capital or KOS, which is very um, if it's specific to the task to the to the resource, then that's very narrow will not be so. Um, so much kind of uh, um, maybe there's those kind of resource only those kind of investments that can you know tend higher risk and potential concerns for whatever investment. But otherwise, there's maybe if it's diversifiable within the firm, actually, it's less concern because you're so valuable across firms and move around. Um, not across firm, the still within firm. But anyway, I think that just, just a kind of a, I would like to see, maybe I learned even more reading more article and understand whether fundamentally, conceptually, whether there, you know, it's worthwhile to think about using the term task to uh, match with KOS or, or still using the traditional concept of resource strategy, et cetera. And that make make more sense. I, I, again, I don't know, I haven't figured out just to kind of read this uh, quick points for, whatever <laughs> for thinking. Okay, all right, thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Ali and, and BK. Really interesting and provocative presentations and comments. Um, and now we're uh, gonna turn it over to the uh, attendees uh, to, to talk about some of these things. Uh, I am posting right now a, a, a Google Doc and we're gonna do this in Google Doc. I'll, I'll share my screen here real quickly. So everybody, um, I, I, I know I have a, a little bit of a tall task here. But what, what we'd like you to do is uh, basically within 20 minutes is to get into your groups. Uh, your groups are named after uh, various uh, condiments all over the world. Um, so you might, have, you might be in the soy sauce group or the ketchup group. Uh, you're going to be in groups of five randomized uh, people. Uh, if you could quickly introduce yourself uh, your name, your affiliation, and when you got your PhD or when you will be expected to get your PhD. The facilitator of the group, and this is important, the facilitator is the person who has had their PhD the longest. Okay, so it's, it's a coming upon the, 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 the group elder to, to make sure that everybody participates and, and gets their uh, thoughts heard. The scribe uh, for the document, so every, every group will have somebody that actually in real time uh, puts down some of these ideas and the scribe will be whoever has uh, achieved their PhD most recently. It's important to, for the scribe to, to write down these ideas quickly as, as, as they come out because DK and Helly are going to be watching this document, uh, taking notes and when we come back from our breakouts, they will uh, take particularly pr provocative questions and, and comment and address them. So uh, your charge is you know, somewhere between two and five compelling research questions. And then if you have time or as time allows, how you might test um, these, uh, these current uh, research questions that, that Helly and, and DK brought up. I know there's been some chat already on that um, or future ideas that you might have uh, and what kind of data or methods uh, you might need for that, okay? And so just record that under the, whoever the scribe is, that the person that got their PhD most recently, uh, put that underneath the group name. So uh, we will break for uh, right around 20 minutes, maybe, maybe 21 uh, minutes, and uh, we'll see you back here soon. It's perfect. All right, so I was... Um in a breakout room while, while everyone else was. And we had a fantastic conversation in a really diverse group, which uh, made it a lot of fun. Sorry, my camera's not on. I just realized it was turned off. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we our plan for what to do now is after all of this really interesting discussion, we wanna give um, DK and Hali a chance to reflect on some of the, the comments that you all put in your Google Doc and also um, provide the opportunity for Q&A as well during that time. So we'll start by letting, um, letting them respond and react to some of the comments in the Google Doc. And if you have questions 
as they are talking, just post those in the chat and we'll try to bring the questions up uh, with them as appropriate and as we have time. So, um, Hali and DK, are you ready? Sure, let me, maybe, Hali. Go ahead, David. Okay, so let me, because I think I'll be reasonably quick here. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by the 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 questions in and the comments in in the Google Doc. I see about you know somewhere between fifty and hundred really wonderful papers <laughs> embedded in the comments and questions there. Lots of very legitimate critiques of the work that uh, some of the work that I've been doing. Uh, lots of very um, very useful questions for us moving forward. Some themes that I thought were interesting, although I didn't capture nearly nearly enough of them. Um, questions about tools to make stuff firm specific that, that, that the thing itself might not be firm specific, but firms might have other tools to make something behave in a firm specific way. Such a fascinating question. The multi-level and aggregation issues here are just massive. They're, they're, they're massive and complex and, and important. Um, the how to measure piece. Um, you know, like how do we measure a firm specific task? Well, you know, I don't think we've ever figured out how to measure firm specific human capital. So, you know, we, we, we theorize it all the time. I don't know that anybody's figured out a way to measure firm specific human capital that's compelling. I think some of the closest, some of the measures that I love the most are like Tomas Bloy's uh, measure of can, can managers predict the very firm specific targets that, uh, that the bank is going to send down to them. And but I think it's very, very hard to, to really get into that. Um, uh, I think Huli's work on, uh, on, on patent self-citations is, is a distal, like a, a compelling but distal measure, right? So, but, it, but it's very, very hard for us to really nail this stuff down. So the measurement issues are very, very, very legitimate concerns and really important. Um, lots of opportunity there for us to figure out, those who figure out how to measure are gonna really move us forward in powerful ways. Um, and uh, managing the matching, the, the resource orchestration conversation is, is, is likely a very powerful frame and a powerful lens for us to think about how we match these things together and how we fit these things together and how we, how we navigate the matching between tasks and, and productive activities and KSAOs within firms. And then, of course, lots of issues related to perceptions. I saw that as a theme as well. You know, like what if firms and employees don't really perceive these things in the same way? And, and Russ and Joe have, have, have pushed us forward that way in really, really, really beautiful ways. Uh, so those are just some of the high level themes I saw, but I didn't capture all of them. And and uh, and really excited for for what we're going to do moving forward with this. So um, so Rhett and Sam, I think um, I, I'm just looking at this. I think it would be really useful for us maybe to after the fact turn this into a note that we could just post for the strategic human capital community that summarizes and categorizes some of this uh, some of this work. So I think it's a nice gift to our community. All this great work that you and we have collectively done today. So that's all I had to say. Thanks, David. I, I totally agree. The idea of uh, probably posting this or elaborate a little more, although some of the, uh, yeah, it's very, a lot of things that uh, can be discovered, I think, explored based on this comments here. Uh, it's, uh, I, on the other hand, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by not sure, if, you know, what to uh, respond. Um, uh, um, so, so I have maybe what strikes me, uh, a few things I can obviously add to, you know, the current understanding of uh, of this literature, for example, the um, uh, I think I like the idea. There's some which group mentioned opportunities for qualitative data uh, cases, interviews, etc. I think this would be uh, given the the difficulty of marrying understanding the firms of human capital. Uh, such kind of uh, research would be really extremely valuable uh, to add on to the limitations of the uh, complement to the current measures and approaches. Um, and the firms of human capital, maybe, uh, I think the question about is built or can be bought, uh, probably more likely to be built, I would think, uh, uh, because if you, you can buy it, then uh, uh, it, it won't befit you, right, if the new firm buying a firm of human capital, and by literally by the definition. Um, uh, but uh, but you can you can definitely buy uh, a combination of the both general human capital firms of human capital, um, but then only use a portion of that and then develop. Eventually, they had the firms of field portion had to be probably developed when working with a certain company. Um, there's also uh, ideas about uh, uh, questions or ideas about applying the. Uh, how it's relevant to the concepts and uh, the, the uh, understanding in terms of uh, applying to, for example, a startup firms, entrepreneurship research, 
uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to explore there. Uh, there has been some application in uh, on spin-offs uh, or, or buying uh, or in the market buying or selling resources, uh, human resources and free turnover, etc. But uh, uh, I think in terms of in the, in the entrepreneurship literature, I'm not aware that there's much application of this. Although if you look at the the traditional classical models of uh, you know related uh, more or less related, they were they were model you know firm startup firm with a core resource and then how you know the the people involved can specialize you know those kind of things. But but uh, I think still the assumptions in these models are um, based on like uh, not really this kind of entrepreneurship we generally talk about in our. Field. It's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know, you know, what kind of value this is going to create and what kind of investments are specific investments are going to be made. Uh, without relaxing those assumptions, I think really uh, would make the picture very different. Um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop here. I'm not sure whether if there's if, if there are questions, I can, you know, more uh, clarify some of the or more in depthly, you know, asking some questions or having some discussion points. That would be. Uh, we can go from there. Let me just stop here for now and see what the other Samantha have something to. Yeah, yeah. It looks like in the comments, um, in the chat, mostly the discussion has been around measuring um, firm specificity and task specificity. Uh, and certainly uh, a lot of uh, thoughts about using qualitative, a qualitative approach to do that. Um, Hali, it sounded like you started talking a little bit about taking a qualitative approach. Um, did, did you all have any additional thoughts on that, uh, DK or Hali, on the measurement of some of these things, since there seems to be a lot of interest in that? Um, <clears throat> go ahead, David, <laughs> go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm just uh, I'm trying to because when uh, I'm working on this this area, then I'll, I'll be inserting some kind of secondary measures, and what I found was uh, in the uh, older literature of you know human capital literature, they were more looking at kind of quite very crude uh, industry level some you know turnover or uh, uh, industry level kind of uh, um, indicators of uh, specificity or. Uh, but, but not really firm specific specific human capital in that sense, uh, and then um, I think that the, yeah many a few of my my studies used as David mentioned use the patent data to measure. It's not really we we are not measuring actually the conceptually is not about firms with human capital. It's about firm specific uh, knowledge or technological assets. Um, the idea is that uh, for companies um, that are having more firm specific knowledge. Which is you know based on self citation, then uh, they would they more likely require employees managers to make corresponding uh, firms of human capital in order to deploy the firms of knowledge more effectively. In that sense, it is a separate concept. Um, so knowledge and uh, knowledge or resource versus human capital they are match in a pair. The understanding is that more firm specific is knowledge or resource, and more likely you have to invest in firm specific capital in order to effectively deploy the resource. So, so we actually never directly measured firms of human capital, all implied in the arguments. Uh, and then, um, so, so the, the, what I talk about in terms of um, the link between uh, what I, you know, a little bit ambiguous when I presented between firms of human capital and the governance mechanism is more actually the firms of knowledge assets and governance mechanism, this link. Uh, but there, there's an implied line, of course, mechanism is through firms of human capital, which we try to capture by moderators and uh, something about managers, employees, characters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, uh, if we have a direct measure, definitely that we can, you know, maybe some of the puzzles is related to the lack of measure of that as well in addition to some of the conceptual difficulties. Uh, so so in, in, from that sense, yeah, that's why I really appreciated the, 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 the suggestion about looking at quantitative data. I think I do have seen some surveys um, just to really ask basically, you know, to what extent your, 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 your innovations or your investments are from successful versus general or how much you can transfer your skills to other companies, et cetera. I have seen that, um, but uh, not in depth interviews and, uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, and real qualitative case-based design of such study I have never seen. So I, I think maybe those kind of studies would be really helpful to tap into some of the some of the things that you know a lot of the issues puzzles we have talked about today. David. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, and I think um, I think that it's really um, this is a really challenging space. And so one of the reasons that I'm um, passionate about this area in general is is because during my dissertation research, I spent you know 18 months doing qualitative work trying to understand what I was actually studying and found it fascinating because I would go to these managers and executives and try to ask them about firm specific human capital and they would look at me like I was nuts. And, and, um, and I didn't say firm specific human capital, right? I would say like, oh, tell me about what types of knowledge and skills within your software developers are hard to take to other companies. And they'd be like, well, what are you talking about? Like, there's, there's no such thing. Like we don't, you know, and there was one time, one time of all my interviews and conversations, I had one executive say, Oh yeah, yeah, we got tons of those. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, oh well, you know, like uh, we're 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 trying to monetize social networks, and um and and that's so unique to us. Nobody else can do that. And and I said, well, but there's a lot of social network companies out there. It seems like everybody's trying to monetize social networks. And so, don't you think that if you figure out how to monetize social networks, you could take that to another? He goes, oh, that's a, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> and like so, the one time I thought I maybe had an answer, it just disappeared right right away. Um, and so I found it really fascinating. In fact, the, the 2015, I think, um, AMP paper that I have with Dave Ulrich is really getting at that issue. It's sort of like the, 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 the deep self-reflections from years of trying to find firm specific human capital in the wild and having a hard time getting real people to identify it and name it and, and have the concepts that we hold dear in, this, in the literature resonate in a real way with practicing managers. So um, now I, I don't think that, it, I, I believe that it's important, right? I, I think it's hard to find and hard to measure and hard to identify, but I think it's really important. So I'm, I'm also really excited about the, the possibility for more careful qualitative research, because I think it can inform a lot of the ways that we think about, um, think about this stuff. Um, the, in, in one of the things that I ended up doing in my dissertation was related to firm specific human capital. I ended up asking um, to, to what extent, uh, the, the question was, how long will it take an employee to get up to speed and functioning when they join your firm? How long will it take an employee to get up to speed and functioning if they have zero experience? How about if they have five years of experience in your industry? How about five years of experience outside of your industry? And then, and then 12 years of experience in your industry, 12 years of experience outside of your industry. And it looked like, it looked like for the people who had like 10 to 15 years of experience in this particular industry, the longer it took for those people to get up to speed and functioning, it looked like that was some rough proxy for how firm specific the stuff they like this, the stuff was they were going to have to learn in order to, to, to get in and get up to speed and functioning within the firm. Of course, super messy, right? Like I'm not persuaded by that measure, but it was just like, an attempt, a rough effort to try to get there. Um, so I think there's ways for us to try to be creative about that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm both frustrated by our lack of progress in measurement and simultaneously okay with it because in lots of our theories, we're measuring vapor trails. We're measuring something that, you know, that we're measuring evidence that something was there rather than actually measuring the thing that we're talking about. And this happens all the time in strategy. Um, and, and so we have to simultaneously embrace that and try to do better at the same time. So, um, so I'm also really excited about the qualitative ideas and, uh, and getting into that in more detail and trying to, trying to parse that out. And, and so, and, and especially some of the comments in here, like, how would you measure a firm specific task? I have no idea, right? How would you measure firm specific skills? I don't know about that one either. Uh, how would you measure a firm specific incentive? I don't really know that either. Like if you look at the measure in my forthcoming org sci paper for firm specific incentives, like it's a really, really rough proxy for a firm specific incentive. And it's a survey measure, right? It's, it's like as close as you can imagine getting in a large scale study, I think, but still really bad in the whole scheme of things. So, um, so I think measurement's really, really critical. Yeah, I think so. Maybe, oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Holly. Uh, just quickly, very quickly, because I was looking at the chat uh, while listening to David, and then there's uh, some suggestions and some papers posted I haven't had a chance to look at, but it seems like there's some measures that I'm not, not aware of, which is better measure 
getting closer measure of probably firm to human capital, I'd love to take a look. And also a uh, very quick, uh, I think I saw Thomas ha uh, saw, has a quest uh, question about uh, if you use quality da data, how do you uh, qualitative work? How do you distinguish effectively uh, from perceived firm specific human uh, firm specificity? From specificity, yes. Um, uh, a very quick response on this one, maybe. Um, uh, yes, it's hard to 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 really distinguish. Uh, perhaps it's uh, eventually it's all about perception. Um, uh, do you do we really have objective? Kind of firms of human capital, uh, it, it might be to a certain level, but eventually, if it's, it's about a human, it, it's, it's about perception. But from the, the qualitative work, we probably can look, ask different people, and then uh, with the same kind of uh, investments or human capital, we can at least from different perspectives we'll look at how they're different, better their differences, and how they're different, and how that affects um, you know, incentive design and also outcomes, etc. Yeah, so the quick response to that. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead, Samasa, when I'm looking at more of this. Yeah, no, I was, uh, Hilly, I, I was tracking that as well about the perceived and um, objective. Uh, it looks like Rhett has brought up an interesting question about employees coming in with firm specific human capital. Uh, do you be interested in talking about that a little bit? Uh, we can start with DK on this one if you'd like. Yeah, th th this one I think is very interesting uh, because we've always presumed that firm-specific human capital is an ex-post investment, that individuals join the firm and then specialize to the firm after they join the firm. <clears throat> but there's a whole host of potential ex-ante matches between individuals with skills and human capital with firms. And so I think it's entirely possible. So, you know, Rhett's supposition here that maybe there's social network relationships, there might be social relationships so that when you step into the firm, you already know what other people know. And, um, and you already understand something about the social network, uh, the, the, the social environment to help things get done within the organization. You may already have expertise in the firm's proprietary knowledge because of your relationships with the other people that, uh, that you've interacted with or because of a prior employment stint at the organization. Um, there's all kinds of things that where, where this might, might be the case. Um, in, in some other work that uh, Ben and Russ and I have done looking at the, the National Basketball Association, we were very interested in this issue of what we thought of as ex anti complementarities the idea that complementarities exist out there and it's more about matching. The, the, the match might be highly specialized to the firm uh, for reasons that just exist out there in the world beforehand that we can't necessarily, you know, uh, that, well, that just don't require the ex post investment. So I think that's a really important area for us to explore because, um, you know, it's interesting to ask the question, does it actually behave the way that firm-specific human capital does, even though there might be these firm-specific matches that exist ex ante? I don't know. Very quick add on that because I, I really had to revise earlier my, my points about it. I think the question relates to this point. I'm convinced actually, yeah, but David, really, do employees do can, you know, come in with firms of human capital? Maybe it's a better match to the companies that, you know, just they just join than previous companies even. Um, so there's an earlier question about uh, can, uh, can you buy uh, firms of human capital or how to internally develop? Because at that time I was saying that you cannot buy, but actually you can buy actually to, to some extent. So it, it, yeah, it, it is interesting to look at to, uh, you know, what kind of human capital is bought versus uh, developed internally um, in itself. Uh, cycle, uh, firm subsidy reward equals tenure. Um, probably not necessarily. <laughs> so be more than tenure is part of that. <laughs> Specifically in our field, our special academic field. But uh, I, I guess uh, David, firm CV incentive is firm CV reward, right? You should <laughs> know a lot to say, more to say about it. But I think, I mean, th these are these are fantastic uh, comments and questions, but but I don't know that we need to hear only from from us. Like uh, we've got some lots of experts in the room here. That we're good point. So, so I think you know, feel free to chime in here and, and join the conversation. Ross and Ben, <laughs> calling names. 
<clears throat> uh, let me let me just tone all my Vegemite into. Uh... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think the discussion has been um, has been great. Uh, I, I guess um, you know if I were to um, you know my takeaway here is that um, firm specificity is incredibly strategically important. It is at the center of um, competitive advantage, and it remains so. And if you look at the kinds of questions that we're raising here, they're really fundamental questions. Um, and I think we don't know the answers to them. Um, and so to me, all that does is underscore the, the opportunity here um, because we know it's really important. We know that it matters and we don't know a whole lot about it. <laughs> And so uh, that just underscores the opportunity. And, and so the discussion's been great. Ben? Ben, is it BD typing? Ben, you're on mute. <laughs> Classic. Oh, it's not a Zoom call until <laughs> Oh. Somebody gets the center square in Zoom bingo. Uh, yeah. So yeah, what I what I said when I was on mute was absolutely brilliant. So, but you'll get the next best uh, take. So I, I was thinking about the conversation between Rhett and Siku about the importance of, of matching and how information is so valuable in the matching process, and just thinking about like how trends in technology and and trends in the world that we're living in are are shaping this that as a society, like we are getting so much better at reducing the transaction costs associated with lots of different jobs. And the gig economy is, is coming for almost everybody. And so in a world where we have so much more information and better platforms to reduce all these transaction costs, I wonder what that's going to mean for the task specificity of, of jobs and then also for the firm specific human capital of people when there's a lot of pressure in the economy to like parse everything out, to extract everything that can be made general, push that into a, a short-term contract-based market. And like what's really going to be left in the sort of jobs that look like jobs to us, that are where people do invest in firm-specific firm human capital and firms and employees do have a long expected time horizon. Like are, are we putting ourselves out of a job a, a little bit by focusing on firm specificity in a world where that's disappearing? That's a that's a, a a nervous comment, Ben, but but I think a really important one, um, and it, and and it makes me think about um, uh, something something that something that that I've been sort of pondering, wrestling with a bit, and and Rob Ployhart's forthcoming JOM uh, is has has really caused me to think a lot about this from a and a lot about this stuff differently because he talks about. In, in his forthcoming JOM editorial, he talks about how um, KSAOs aren't really valuable until they lead to performances, that individuals, like they perform something, they behave in some way within the firm. So it's like these behavioral experiences within the firm. So KSAOs aren't valuable until they translate into behaviors and into performance behaviors, I think is the technical term that he uses, performance behaviors. Um, but that that causes me to think a little bit about um, what's the difference between a firm-specific KSAO versus a firm-specific performance behavior versus a firm-specific outcome? Like, what is the level of firm specificity and where does the specificity apply? And so we could have situations where KSAOs are no longer very firm-specific, but there might be performances or specific behaviors that are highly firm-specific. What's interesting to me about that is that, you know, we have we have so tightly coupled this all these things into the human capital word that that 
that I think we're sometimes sort of uh, talking at odds with each other because there's so much packed into that concept of human capital. But it's entirely possible for you to have in very, very transportable and easily applicable KSAOs, but apply them at times in very unique contexts to very unique outcomes without necessarily gaining what we would traditionally think of as firm specific skills. That we could just be applying general skills in, in focused and specific ways for a short period of time. So in that case, it would be a firm specific performance uh, with firm specific outcomes, but doesn't necessarily require investment on my part in skills that are not transferable to other places. Um, and so, um, so I think there, there are ways for us to sort of think about, uh, about what that looks, looks like in a gig world. Where, uh, where we might be performing a, a ton of firm-specific performances with highly general KSAOs. That's interesting. Um, I, just, uh, I was thinking um, another way of uh, um, maybe addressing, not necessarily just or comment on Ben's uh, point, is whether it's um, the type of firms of human capital has evolved over time. Maybe in the past is more related to tasks and projects and the uh, firm resources. But um, um, so as long as there's still is reputation, firm brands, uh, et cetera, network uh, is still important. I think there's still probably uh, firms of human capital, or whatever, uh, involved in that. But it, but it's not the type that yeah traditionally. Uh, 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 maybe more um, um, human-based, network-based, uh, interaction-based, um, instead of a knowledge uh, task or, you know, project-based. I, I, yeah, so, so that, that might be something to, to, to think about. I need to think of them more, but it just, uh, we still have probably overall the, 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 you can, if you think that the uh, important firms you had declined overall, possible, um, but uh, it might be that some types become more important than some other types also. Meanwhile, just a quick thought on that. Okay, so we are close to the um, end of our time uh, and the discussion is getting really interesting. There's a lot of interesting comments in the chat. So um, if you have a chance, take a look at some of that. I'm gonna go ahead and start to close us out just to uh, be respectful of everyone's time. So um, I just wanna thank DK and Heli for taking the time to provide us with all of their interesting thoughts and respond to all of these questions. Um, and also to Rhett and John who have been sort of very involved in organizing this session from the beginning. I also wanna mention that we have two more seminars planned um, going forward. There is one in May and one in June. The one in May is on inequality and in the one in June, do you remember what the one in June is? New methods. Yeah, new Judicial methods. Capital. Yeah, so those will be really interesting. We hope you'll consider attending. Um, and yeah, just con we hope you'll continue this conversation post-seminar. Rhett and I will take a note of David's uh, suggestion that we put something together based on uh, all of the thoughts you had from your breakout groups. And Rhett, did you have any final comments before we close out? No, thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll have uh, the recording, the chat, and the, the Google Doc content up on the uh, Strategic Human Capital IG website. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. So that's that's it for today. Thank you, Samasa and Rhett, for, again, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Haley and, and DK. Lots of Thank fun. you all for attending. See you Hope guys. to see you at the next one. Yeah. See you in May. <laughs>